Hello audience and welcome once again to another great show of inspirational journeys. Today we are in this beautiful park outside in Rocky Hill and I have the privilege today to have by my side the great Dr. Bridget Cooper. <laughs> She's been on the show before, actually it was one year ago mm -hmm. that you were yes. Uh, with us in the show and she's back and she's got uh, plenty of things to tell us uh, she's been writing she's mm -hmm. been public speaking so a little different Bridget. thank you a little different public these days <laughs> yeah uh, the public is That's more true. like this or uh, on an exhausting zoom call um, sure. or something but yeah thank you thank you so much for having me back it's of so course. exciting because last time we spoke um, we came and I spoke about little landslides which sure. had come out a couple of years before and I see on display you've got my most recent book <laughs> um, pain rebel and that just came out just a couple of weeks ago um, I used the um, COVID time to you know gain a couple of pounds um, <laughs> catch up on some Netflix oh. <laughs> uh, you know get really used to social distancing and finish a book so, Great. Yeah, Great. It, was, it was really fun. So I'm so happy to be here to be able to talk yeah. to you about the, the concepts and the process and anything that would help your viewers be inspired by this. Of course. And thank you so much for being here. And I remember when we had our conversation the last time, uh, we spoke about uh, Little Land's Life and what promoted uh, your desire to write that book. Yeah. And uh, it was a heavy conversation. Very. You know, and I... I'm grateful that you came into the show and you were so honest about your message and the things that you had gone through. Mm. And some of those things resonated in most of our viewers. Yeah. You know, they were really shocked by the things they heard, but then they were inspired by how you overcame and how you present yourself to the world and the journey that you've gone through to get where you are now. And by reading, uh, Pain Rebel, I realized that now is more of a tangible uh, book. Like it's a program. More, it's a program. Right, it's right. a step-by-step -step guide. Right. And I could imagine now a lot of people are being faced with their own challenges oh, and they're yeah. isolated at right. home. Right. So what was your intent when you wrote the book? So it's funny, the, the process was that I started writing Pain Rebel mm -hmm. um, back in fall of 2017. Um, so I had finished Little Landslides the year before and published it. And I was looking forward to writing this more um, manual driven of kind of the follow up to Little Landslides. Because Little Landslides was a very powerful and instrumental um, piece about how you rise up through trauma by telling my own personal story and, and mm -hmm. making reflections upon it. And I had a small guide in the back because I couldn't leave people hanging just with sure. this really raw story. But Pain Rebel was going to answer that question of how does it actually look when you've been carrying pain? How do you put it down? How do you move on mm -hmm. from that pain journey and create something different? And I started writing it in the fall of 2017. And then, as you may recall, I had a TEDx talk in early 2018. Mm -hmm. And that kind of carried away my business. I started you know, doing a lot of public speaking on that, talking about the experience of that. So Pain Rebel sat to the side. I had mm -hmm. the cover done. I was, I was ready. I had probably 75% of it you know, written, at least in concept. And I thought, you know, I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. And then the summer came, and it was my my older daughter's last summer before her senior year. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't want to focus and go, you know, hold myself up in a room and try to finish this book. I'll do it in the fall. Fall will be a perfect time. I'll get it out in the fall. It's a little bit more of a break than I've taken before with books. But I had a TEDx talk, and then this has been a good journey. And uh, on August 31st, 2018, uh, I was riding in a car that was sideswiped, well, uh, T-boned by an Uber driver um, and uh, it was a rollover accident and during the accident I suffered a traumatic brain injury. And I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was a concussion that just wasn't resolving and it took many, many, many months to finally get um, the testing mm -hmm. that was required to find that out. And my symptoms in having a traumatic brain injury is that I have a really hard time processing written information. So any kind of reading or organizing words or um, concepts in that way and my recall. So thinking about diving back into a bunch of notes, it's <laughs> just, it was, it was more than daunting. It was, it was a lot. So it took a really long time to return to it. But it was always this, you know, I, I think of, um, uh, you know, the universe having a really great sense of humor, at least where I'm concerned. And I thought, that's really funny that I'm writing Pain 
rebel. Uh -huh. And I'm in pain, <laughs> right? And so I, I kept going back to it. I'd get a page or two done, and then I would stop because it just it made me feel so sick and so disoriented and mm -hmm. so exhausted mm -hmm. and worn out for all the things that I had to do to be able to function mm -hmm. in my life. And when COVID hit, mm -hmm. I had already sent myself this goal that by summer, by my birthday, I would get it done. Mm -hmm. And when COVID hit, I said, game on, yes. game on. Yes. This, is, this is a sign from every part of the universe that this that has this to get, moment. this is the moment. This yes. is, you know, I need, I need to get this out and need to get it out faster. And the only thing that was frustrating to me was that we had um, a lot of, um, I love the motor road. Oh, we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of, uh, Focus, on, yeah, that's perfect. We had a lot of focus on um, that isolation piece, and a lot of people were diving into books and diving into Netflix series and all that thing. Sure. And I thought, wouldn't it have been better if I could have finished this just a little bit earlier, and then everyone could have started yes. COVID yes. reading this, and then, yes. but no but matter. We still, we still in COVID. We are. You know, we are going to be here for a while. There. And yeah. I, I would assume that the book is has come in the right moment where people are also just because of the fact that they, they are isolated they're facing their own fears yes. they're facing their own challenges um, just for the fact of the isolation absolutely a lot of people are not being able to cope you know yeah. there's that difference between you know different personalities you know some people Extroverts, treat their challenges right? in one way oh, some yeah. others and I would imagine that a lot of people are, are faced now with their reality. Yeah. Uh, they're having time to think. They're having time uh, to process where they are. They miss their relatives. Yeah. So I would assume that the book, it comes at the right moment. It does. You know, I, I read about this um, guy who uh, lives on, manages really, mm -hmm. runs this little island off the coast of Italy. Mm -hmm. He came out there one time, maybe 50 years ago and visited the island and the caretaker of the mm -hmm. island basically passed the keys to the island to him. It sounds mm -hmm. almost, you know, like a romantic uh -huh. uh, book. And he was interviewed by a major newspaper and he said, what's really difficult for people in this COVID experience and this isolation is they're finally having to look at themselves in ways that they've been able to busy themselves away yeah. from for so long. They've been able to run to the gym or go to the bar that's, or go to the, true. you know, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, not only are they, Everyone, everything yeah, is taken, everything's away, taken away. There's no, there are very few distractions other than maybe Facebook and social media uh, sure. of other sorts. And they're also having to be more, um, in, they're intersecting the people who are in their homes more. Mm -hmm. So if they have people who are in their homes and there's been any level of conflict, that conflict skyrockets because there's no hiding, there's no running away and going out with your friends and you know staying at work late or what mm -hmm. have you works at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. So it's it's calling into question for a lot of people their awareness of where they've been carrying pain mm -hmm. and their desire and almost demand to release it in some way that that, mm -hmm. that is healthier for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Have, have you had clients that have reached out to you in these difficult times yes. wanting to have your perspective oh, your support yeah you know I was worried at first so when I when COVID first hit I had two engagements that mm -hmm. were out of state and I had to you know fly to or drive to and I was and they were both canceled mm -hmm. and I started getting really concerned knowing that I do a lot of keynotes and I do a mm -hmm. lot of in-person retreats and workshops that my business was going to really suffer as a result of COVID mm -hmm. and I actually found the inverse in terms of the demand for my services because I we are all facing a mental health challenge and mm -hmm. I've spoken with some of my healer friends mm -hmm. and I consider myself a healer and we've talked about the idea that this is trauma mm -hmm. that this whole COVID experience has been traumatic for different for people at different levels for different reasons and there is a lot of grief mm -hmm. and working through trauma and working through grief are like the, the cornerstones of pain rebel and the work that I do so I've been called into companies to do a lot of personal and professional development and one-on-ones because people are hungry for that sort of healing, knowing that that's what they need to do to make their lives better. And, and, and you, you just mentioned it in the personal, um, in a personal way, and also work the work Absolutely. Course. Oh, the, the you know, teamwork and people working together and trying to figure out how, yes. how to feel connected when they are not even in the same building anymore That's and it. trying to remember the purpose, all of that. So those are That's things, it. those are um, themes that are really resonating with, you know, company presidents and, you know, directors of HR and that sort of thing. And they're reaching out to, to me and to people like me yeah. to be able to help boost everyone and connect everyone better. Yeah.
And I know we have limited time. Oh yes. <laughs> I want to keep going and going and going. <laughs> 30 minutes is not that much time, it's but not. I really, really want to talk about, um, there is an area of your book that really, really uh, resonated in me. And it's the one where you talk about the contract. Mm, I love that. And it's a My great favorite. image. Yeah. Because I never thought about it in those standards. Yeah. Like when you talked about it, you know, and, and you, you're you better to explain. I will. I will. So a lot of people, when they talk about um, things that are still being dragged along into their present from their past, from their childhoods, mm -hmm. from their early relationships, they talk about belief structures and, mm -hmm. you know, the way I was raised and, and things like that that seem unchangeable mm -hmm. right they're just part of me yes. you know they're they're in my DNA it's like my blood exactly. type I can't change that mm -hmm. and so when I'm working with people and I'm trying to change belief structures people wrestle me down trying to hold on and convince me as to why their belief structure is the one that works mm -hmm. and in doing that they deepen their tie to that belief structure mm -hmm. so many years ago I started working with clients on what I call contracts which is this idea that early in life often by the age of seven when we've kind of developed our framework about what the world looks like we have signed contracts we have agreed with those experiences and with the people who are teaching us through mm -hmm. uh, you know um, osmosis or directly mm -hmm. that there are certain ways that we need to think about ourselves other people relationships our potential the world and all of those beliefs we agreed to believe them we mm -hmm. didn't know we had a choice, exactly. but we agreed to believe them. And in that agreement, I constructed it as a contract. Mm -hmm. Because we can imagine, most of us mm -hmm. have signed a contract, whether it was a car lease or you know a, a, a rental agreement, something. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that if someone fails to hold up their side of the bargain, we can, we can rip it up. Mm -hmm. Or if we have fulfilled the terms of the contract, we can, it's over. Mm -hmm. Or if something else about it we don't like, we can pay a penalty, but it can go away. So it's very tangible to think about and those agreements that we made as contracts we can rip up. Mm -hmm. And so I work with people in the book and one-on-one -on, -one on how to look and examine and evaluate our old contracts sure. and decide what would work for us as a new contract. As, as an adult. Correct. As now that we have the sure. wherewithal, we have the capacity mm -hmm. to say, I don't think that's right, or mm -hmm. that doesn't seem fair, or mm -hmm. I don't want to live like that. Mm -hmm. And to be able to write those new contracts, and so I have clients actually who have their old contracts and their new contracts, and when we have conversations and they tell me about some stupid thing they did or some, you know, a mistake or, you know, upsetness that they mm -hmm. have, I, I look at them and or you know, I'm on the phone with them and I say, so, um, which contract was that? <laughs> oh, we it was the to? old contract, you know, so it, it makes it distant enough that it doesn't feel so personal mm -hmm. when we talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that allows people enough perspective mm -hmm. to be able to make those changes in the way that they're they're addressing themselves and other people. Sure, and the fact that we can rewrite it yes. for ourselves and, you know, write new terms and conditions. Absolutely. And that brings up the topic of boundaries, oh, which yes. is something that I know you talk a lot about a and lot I've about. learned a lot from what I've read from you as to how to establish boundaries which with everyone right you know even family members we absolutely most of all family members <laughs> tend to be the toughest yeah. ones because we love them and we sure. had a history with them and so we, we as you said we kind of believe that what we've done so far is what is and it works yeah. and we don't need to change it but then we start realizing that no you comes know, at a cost it, yes yeah and for us and for them and, and boundaries are really that that invisible space between you and me when I say what you're doing right now is about and for you what I'm doing right now is about and for me and where they intersect we need to have a conversation mm -hmm. but your stuff isn't my stuff and my stuff isn't your mm -hmm. stuff and if you're falling down and having a problem I don't need to make it my crisis I can offer my assistance but I don't make it my crisis and a lot of people who have been through like 12 steps, you know, they've been in any kind of addiction recovery. When they read my stuff, they're like, oh my gosh, you're talking about codependency. Oh my gosh, that's step four, you know. And, and it's funny because I did, I was raised in an addictive system and I did do work and treatment in addiction. And so it all is informed by trying to create healthy systems. And we I've joked in the 12 step community that everybody could use a 12 step meeting, honestly, because there's so many uh, helpful tips 
on how to create and form healthy relationships and create those boundaries that allow you to um, have and demonstrate your power over your life so that you have more to give other people versus occupying yourself with what they feel, what they might do, how sure. they might respond, because that takes away your power and puts the focus on in a space that isn't healthy for either party. Definitely. So those boundaries are really yes. everything. And how do you work with a client, uh, especially now you know that we're going through COVID-19, that does not realize the power that they have? Oh, yeah. You know? It's, it's interesting because um, I start with a little bit of education and a mm -hmm. challenge to see where they have the roadblocks to where their power comes from. And most of that exists in their contracts. Mm -hmm. That they have been believing that the world is done unto them. That they, you know, in all of these ways that the world is the victim. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the victim thing is, is, is very easy to understand how that happens because we've all at some level been victimized. Mm -hmm. We have been the victims of something. Being a victim is, is not about having been victimized. It's about seeing yourself as having no power to move away from that experience, to reclaim mm -hmm. your potential. And so I, I start with their old contracts. I start with trying to figure out how they came to understand that that was true. And what I often, I actually had a client yesterday and she gave me this old contract. She you know said it out loud to me. And she said, right? And I said, oh, you wanted me to agree with you <laughs> because you believed that what you were saying was correct. Mm -hmm. There, that's, it's not correct. Mm -hmm. It's correct for you. Mm -hmm. But because just because you're saying it as truth doesn't make it truth. And so challenging that idea that even if they believed it and they took all the information that came at them ever since those mm -hmm. moments that they, that they agreed to those contracts to reinforce that idea doesn't mm -hmm. make it true. Mm -hmm. It simply makes it what they experience. Mm -hmm. So it's really just kind of, it's like massage for yes. the mind, you yes. know, is trying to get them to just let go of the certainty about what they believe and allow for this, there might be another way. Sure. There might be something else going on here. Yes. And that helps. And once they do, yeah. once they realize it, then what's the next step? The next How do you start changing? Yeah, it's it, the writing of the new contracts is is pivotal, and I and I also bring people through some different exercises that allow them to grieve what they've lost for having a, a, aligned with those old contracts for so long. Some people are coming to me in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they have an entire lifetime behind them: divorces, lost jobs, mm -hmm. you know, missed opportunities, and that's part of the process of looking at them as contracts instead of as really bad decisions sure. because once they can see that the contracts are what cost them those opportunities the contracts are what are stopping them from holding the pen in the story of their own life then they start wanting to change away from that because mm -hmm. they recognize if, if i can just write a new contract mm -hmm. this can be different and so it starts with that, and sometimes it starts at the level of thought, and sometimes it starts with the level of behavior, which is to say, maybe you don't feel motivated to go to the gym. Now, I can't talk to you because I know you're motivated <laughs> to go to the gym. But for a lot of not us, always. we're not motivated not to always. go. Yeah, we're not motivated to go to the gym. Yeah. So it's not about waiting for motivation. Sure. It's about going, mm -hmm. and then tell me how you feel. Sure. So, okay, so you don't believe that contract. You don't mm -hmm. believe you're worthy of asking for that job. Okay, I'm not gonna wait for you to feel worthy. I just want you to go ask for the job. Mm -hmm. And then see what happens from there. So sometimes it's coming at it from a couple of different places to see what muscle can be okay. worked. So, the so it's pushing yourself to go out of your comfort oh, zone. Oh, absolutely. To then kind of navigate as to, you know, what works for you yeah. in terms of the healing. Absolutely. And I think, you know, being in front of your own challenges and realizing what was a trauma. Right. That sometimes we don't even realize that something that we went through has stayed with yes. us as a trauma and all of a sudden after 40 years comes out and you're like what is this yeah how did that yeah how did that how, affect how, me yeah yes. how, and I and I write about it in in pain rebel I talk about this idea of a pain resume mm -hmm. 
which is to say that, you know, when you meet a new friend or you start a new relationship, you know, and someone says, so tell me about you. You might tell them about your career. <laughs> the whole but then you go, you're like, first my mother, then my dad, then my best friend, then my professor. And we go through this like litany, right? And we might open it all up on the first yeah, date. Sure. We might wait six months, but we, we get it out there. You know, we dish it. And when we look at that resume, we recognize that holding that as the story and how we came to be, it puts us in a position of being victim. Not because we weren't victimized, because we absolutely were. But it puts us in that space. And if we could rewrite that resume to see it differently, not that we weren't victimized, mm -hmm. but that those experiences allowed us to have more power, more insight, more empathy, more whatever that is. And now we get to decide how to do this differently. A lot of people had, I, I, somebody um, asked me the other day about little landslides and mm -hmm. said, how courageous, and I think you mm -hmm. said it too, about to come out and tell these stories. And there's part of that that I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that people say that. And the other part of me wants to scream because mm -hmm. when we think about someone having been victimized and I tell the story mm -hmm. about how I was victimized, why is that brave for me to say? It was not my sin. Mm -hmm. It was not my behavior. Sure. I didn't write a book about how I hurt and cheated and killed other people, mm -hmm. right? I wrote about how other people did that to other people, mm -hmm. right? To myself and sure. others. And that is where I think the victim story piece can get us really locked, is that we feel shame for someone else's shame. Sure. It's not ours. Mm -hmm. It's theirs. Mm -hmm. And we need, and then the way we take our power back is to hand it back to them, yeah. is to say, absolutely not. I will not take that on for me. Yeah. That is yours. You keep that. Yes. And that's the boundary. And, yeah. and, and then we have to let go. We have to and let we go. We have to let go, and it's so hard. It is hard. It and is it's so hard, hard because we, we think that, and I cover this in a couple of different books and in the TED Talk, about forgiveness. And people have this, I want to create a new word. I yeah. have just decided I'm going to patent a new word because forgiveness is so loaded with so much, you know, mm -hmm. religiosity and other things about it. But forgiveness is about saying, you did this, you took my past, you don't get my present, mm -hmm. and you don't get my future. Mm -hmm. And the way that you will get my present and my future is if I continue to feel the toxic feelings that you left me with mm -hmm. forever to remind myself mm -hmm. of your injury and to keep reliving it over and over to try to protect myself from hypothetical future injuries. Sure. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. The only way you can do any of that is by having healthy boundaries, standing in your power, mm -hmm. realizing where you have control and where you don't and not reliving those th same things over and over again. You can't mm -hmm. change the past. Exactly. You can only do something about the present and the mm -hmm. future. And Pain Rebel tries to do that for people, is to harness that energy, to do that recovery and that release so that you can move forward, and not that you won't experience pain, but that mm -hmm. you won't pack it and keep it with you. Mm -hmm. And there, there was, um, I, I heard in one of your talks, you talk about when you went to one of the prisons, I think it was yeah. Colorado, Oh, uh, no, I think it, it was kind of either, it was either Connecticut or maybe Virginia. And yeah. you mentioned about how you, uh, you know, were counseling uh, yeah. this uh, person yeah. who was there for crime. And, yeah. and he, you know, he was talking things about his father and oh, how yeah. he hated him. And then hated him. when you confronted him, yeah. tell us the story. I oh my gosh, I him. can't wait. I want, I want to meet this guy. Someday mm -hmm. we're going to bump into each other mm -hmm. in Costco or something. I don't know. Um, free shout out to Costco. <laughs> Uh, but so this, so I was in this group, and I um, I was the only per, um, non inmate in the group, and you know I'm not a very big person, so this was a, you know a fairly um, intimidating environment, and we were in a locked room, and there were probably 15 or 20 guys, uh, very large sizes, and we were talking about some of the issues that come up when you are raised in trauma or dysfunction and how that affects where you are right now, and. I let the room quiet and I looked at him and I said, so when do you think you're going to decide to stop being loyal to him? 
And honest to God, Miracle, he almost jumped across the I room at imagine. me because he was, you know, and all sorts of curse words were coming mm -hmm. out of his mouth. I'm not loyal to that. Bleepity bleep bleep bleep. The room, though, because they, the rest of the individuals, they weren't being confronted, so mm -hmm. they were soaking this in. They were, mm -hmm. wait a second, she's mm -hmm. got something here. And I said, well, that's interesting. After you calm down for a second and quiet it, I said, that's interesting. Because it sounds to me as though you are being quite loyal to him because you are acting out exactly what he said you were capable of. And you are being exactly like him. That sounds like loyalty to me. So I ask you again, when are you going to decide to choose to be happy over being loyal? And it sat with him for a minute and we went on and we discussed some other things. And as we were walking out, you know, they were walking out saying goodbye to me eyes were filled with tears he was thanking me profusely because all of a sudden he went he just he and, and, shifted and you that. shifted yes. yeah you shifted he shifted the gear. yeah he shifted he shifted yes. that that experience of taking himself and stopping to be victim and being the author being able to write the rest of the story in the way that he wants to write it not in the way that was predicted for him yes. That's that that that's powerful. It was. That's it was. Powerful. It was. It was one of the most. Um, I, I felt every time I left that. It was a volunteer <laughs> yes, assignment. Yes. Every time I left there, I was like, I should be paying them. <laughs> I know this is so rewarding. Yes. You know, to be able to 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 see people who are in that kind of pain uh, release some of it, knowing that domino effect or that sure. butterfly effect of letting go of some of that pain and trying to heal himself okay. might mean he'll heal his family, might mean that he might not pass that legacy on sure, to his children. Sure. And it's a game changer. It's a it it's absolute a game, changer. game changer. Oh, we don't have too much time. I know. We'll come back. I'll come back. I'll come back. <laughs> we have to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have to come to our show again. Thank you. And I, I don't want to end the program without having your advice as yeah. to people right now where we are. Yeah. Um, this isolation is not gonna end tomorrow. Right. It will last for a couple of months, who knows, maybe yeah. years. Right. What would be your advice to someone that is struggling um, for many reasons? Yeah. They feel alone, right. uh, they are confronting a family situation, as you said, right. you know, in the household. Yeah. What would be your advice? There's so much. So one of the things that I would say is there's a saying that grief is simply love with no place to go. And there is so much grief in this. Whether you have a child who's missing a graduation or a prom or just all of the rituals that they're used to. Whether you're grieving the loss of a human being who's left this world because of the illness. Uh, grieving connection. Grieving all sorts of things. There's so much grief here. And if grief is simply love with no place to go, the advice that I've been giving all of my clients is find ways to go out and show love. Whether it's volunteering in some way, giving blood, you know, make, people were mm -hmm. making masks, um, mm -hmm. sending handwritten letters, anything you can do to take, because it's energetic. It's, sure. it's all, all that grief is just, it's cloudy, dark energy that sits here. Send it out with love. Send it out with energy. Send it out with healing. Do something productive. And go gently with yourself. I mean, I finished a book. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of people haven't gotten off the couch much. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge that you're in pain. Acknowledge that you're suffering. And take one small step every day, if you're stuck in that sort of space, to reach out to other people, to ask for help, to mm -hmm. offer yourself. To, so open up, to open up yourself. To yeah. Others. And so many mm -hmm. of us find so much healing and giving. So find a way to give. Dr. Bridget, I don't want to yeah. let you go. No. <laughs> I want to keep going. <laughs> well, audience, it's been a wonderful afternoon. Thank Thanks. you so much, Dr. Bridget. You always bring um, inspiring messages, and you are very helpful. So, audience, I hope you have enjoyed every minute of our conversation. If you want to know more about Dr. Bridget, where they can find you? DrBridgetCooper.com or friend me or uh, Instagram, Dr. Bridget Cooper. Excellent. Thanks. So, if you have any questions also about Dr. Bridget, you could always write to Inspirational Journeys. Well, thank you very much and hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. And as Dr. Bridget said, let's just share love. Let's just stay connected. And I think that will help all of us through this tough time. And we'll make it happen. Thank you so much for being here.